Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Selling Greenville, what I like to call your favorite real estate podcast here in Greenville, South Carolina. I'm your host, as always, Stan McCune, realtor right here in Greenville, South Carolina. You can find all of my contact information in the show notes if you need to reach out to me for any of your real estate needs. Please like this show uh, if you're in YouTube. I now am and broadcasting the show on YouTube. That will get better as we uh, as we continue on because I've never done the YouTube thing before. So just bear with me on that. Uh, but for those that want to watch, please go to YouTube, search for not selling Greenville, search for my name, Stan McCune, M-C-C-U-N-E, and you should be able to find me on there. Um, and like those, uh, please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, whatever podcast app you use. Please go ahead and leave us a five-star rating. Please go ahead and leave a short little review if you can to get the show out to as many people as possible. I'd appreciate if you guys could do that. And uh, I've got a lot of very exciting things for the show coming up here in the next few weeks, and I think you guys will enjoy it. But today I'm going to do something a little bit different. And I'm, I'm hoping to really, as I'm getting more into this uh, this video thing, I want to make sure that we always keep this, as I said last week, audio friendly. But I also want to make this engaging for those of you that are watching on uh, on YouTube. And so that has really got me thinking with a, a whole lot of uh, new creative juices, as it were. Um, and it can be difficult sometimes to come up with with new content for a very niche podcast, such as one that's focused on real estate just in the Greenville area. I do sometimes branch out into some other topics uh, that are that are more generic with real estate or more generic with Greenville. Um, but today, I want to discuss something that has really taken uh, the world by storm, and that is Chat GPT. Um, it, it is one of the most interesting things to me that's come out technologically in quite some time, maybe since perhaps the iPhone, that might be the the closest thing that, that I can recall, like being some kind of a major technological breakthrough. And some people, if you're really into tech, um, you probably don't think it's very remarkable. But for those of us that are not super duper tech savvy, and I'm decently tech savvy, but uh, but for those of us that don't do programming and, and whatnot, which I don't, um, this chat GPT software is pretty remarkable. And for those that don't know, um, I, I'm not going to give a very technical definition of what it is. It's some kind of language uh, related software, but essentially you can have a conversation with a chat bot. Like if you go on like a support uh, desk, you know, let's say that you're with Verizon and you're having issues with your phone. And so you go to Verizon support online and they set you up with a chat bot. It's like that, except it's a chatbot that knows like a ton of stuff and can do a lot of a, a lot of data aggregation um, and can even do fun stuff like uh, you can have it write a song or, or write a write a poem about your dog in the form of, uh, you know, Edgar Allan Poe or, so, you know, just different silly things like that. Uh, but you can just have a conversation with it. And sometimes it'll be wrong and you can point it out and just be like, hey, no, actually, that's that's not correct. And they'll say, oh, I apologize. Yes, you're right. Um, I, I got my information screwed up. I like to uh, read it back in the voice of, of C3PO. I'm not going to do that for the purposes of the show. Um, but I was thinking, what if we could try to utilize this for the purposes of uh, of real estate, specifically in the Greenville area? Like, what are some potential uses for this? And specifically through the lens of, okay, people that don't know how to program, that don't know Python, which I think is like a programming language. It's one of the the core ones that, that you want to use if you're uh, really trying to harness this uh, GPT technology. Um, and and again, I don't program, so this is practical for me. I wanted to, to, to think through, okay, what how can I utilize this technology potentially to to help myself or potential clients or just listeners uh, to be able to do searches on here for real estate? Now, I want to preface this that really anything that you're searching uh, for this on, you could use Google for, right, at the end of the day. What is kind of different about this is that whereas Google will tell you what, you know, 10 
million people thought about something or, or it'll give you 10 million results. ChatGPT just gives you one simplified result that's kind of an aggregate of what you might find all across the web. So it just kind of simplifies some things. Um, but with that simplicity, it will be wrong. So it's not nearly at the point of replacing uh, any sort of professionals. It's it's nowhere near that technologically advanced. Um, but I think at some point it could, it could get to that point. Um, but I wanted to have a little bit of fun with this episode and actually... In real time, so if you're watching on YouTube, you're going to see me doing this in real time. Communicate with Chat GPT and ask it questions related to real estate. So I'm going to, um, on YouTube, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. For those of you that have interacted with Chat GPT, um, you will be no stranger to this. So I am sharing my screen uh, right now on YouTube. And I'm just going to be using, for those of you that are are uh, kind of into the software, I'm just going to be using the default GPT 3.5. I do have access to, uh, I did pay the upgrade to plus for GPT 4, um, but it's just a little bit too slow right now. Uh, GPT 4 is for the purposes of of doing this show. It, this show would go on for hours. Um, and so I'm, I'm not going to mess around with that at the moment. Um, but I am going to, uh, just in real time here, just ask it some questions and just kind of we're just going to see what happens. I, I did uh, I did test some of these questions out um, to start, um, but it does not always a answer questions the same way if you ask them multiple times. So I have no idea what it's going to say. So uh, so this is going to be fun. So, uh, again, I've already asked some form of these questions uh, to this software at some point in the past, but I'm going to go ahead and do it again and see what happens. So we're going to start with this again, just having a little bit of fun, but this will be, this will be practical. Um, I'm going to ask this software, have you ever heard of the podcast selling Greenville, right? Cause that's, that's what we're doing right now. Um, says, as an AI language model, I don't have the ability to hear or listen to podcasts, but I am familiar with the podcast Selling Greenville. It is a podcast that focuses on real estate in Greenville, South Carolina, and is hosted by Michael Mamau, a real estate agent with Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, C. Dan Joyner Realtors. The podcast covers various topics related to buying and selling homes in Greenville, as well as the local real estate market and community events. This is hilarious because when I asked it before, it actually knew that uh, that I was a podcast host. So I'm going to actually correct. I'm going to say, um, actually, this podcast is hosted by Stan McCune. It says, I apologize for the mistake in my previous response. You are correct that the podcast Selling Greenville is hosted by Stan McCune, a real estate agent with Keller Williams Greenville Upstate. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. No. Um, actually, Stan McCune is with Berkshire Hathaway Home Services. I apologize for the mistake in my previous result. You are correct. Um, okay. All right. So uh, so we fixed that. All right. Um, so that's interesting. So so that kind of gives you an indication of, of what the software could be like. I, I literally asked it the same question yesterday when I was prepping for this, and it got everything correct. And now I ask it today and it got something incorrect. Maybe uh, maybe Michael with, I, I don't even, uh, apologies, Michael. Um, I, I don't know Michael Mamau. Um, I've, I've never heard of him. If, if he is with my company, now my company is quite large. Um, I, I wonder if he's trying to hijack my brand. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I, I, I don't know who Michael is, but I'm sure he is or was a good real estate agent. Um, all right, so let's get uh, let's get more practical here. Now that I've been insulted um, by this chatbot that doesn't know um, who I am, or uh, you know the fact that I do this podcast, let's jump right in. What are some common mistakes people make when buying a home? And these are some things that no, uh, one thing about the software is nothing in it is going to be completely earth shattering, but at the same time, it will sometimes provide some kind of thought provoking responses to things. So here is what it said. There are several common mistakes that people make when buying a home, including overextending on the budget. One of the biggest mistakes that home buyers make is stretching their budget too thin. 
It's important to consider not just the purchase price of the home, but also other costs such as closing costs, property taxes, and maintenance. Good thought there. Um, number two, skipping the pre-approval process. Now, if you're a client of mine, you are not getting by uh, skipping the pre-approval process. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip over the explanation for that. Not researching the neighborhood. Good thought. It's important to research the neighborhood you're considering, including the local schools, crime rates, and amenities. This will help you make an informed decision and avoid unpleasant surprises down the road. That's great advice right there. And I've told you guys before, due to steering laws, um, me, me as a realtor and other realtors, at least the good ones, we have to be very careful with what we say about specific neighborhoods. Um, we're realtors with my company. We are told not to look at crime statistics so that we're not liable for those things. We're told not to give commentary on school districts outside of just what's factual. Um, and so, so we can't give opinions on these types of things because that could be a violation of steering laws. Um, that said, I can direct you. And, and if you want to use chat GPT, it can also direct you to, uh, to where you can get information on those things. Um, number four. Oh, I like this. I didn't ask it to do this. Not hiring an experienced agent. Wow. Chat GPT is just doing my work for me. A good real estate agent can help you navigate the home buying process and provide valuable insights and advice. It's important to choose an experienced agent. Whew. Man, hot off the press here. Who knows the local market and has a good track record of success. How about an agent that has a podcast that's been going for over three years? Do you think that uh, you know, I might ask you that. All right, we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. Um, not getting a home inspection. A home inspection can cover potential issues with the property that may not be visible to the untrained eye. Skipping this step can lead to costly repairs down the road. I almost never uh, recommend skipping the home inspection. Um, there are a few very unique situations for like investment properties where I have someone that's very experienced with understanding what uh you know what property conditions look like and whatnot um that a home inspection would be overkill but 90 probably 98 percent of my closings um i'm telling my clients to get uh, a home inspection done um even uh even if they're i, I have closings with with g general contractors and people like that and we still go through that step because you never know what you'll find um, number six. Oh, this is great too. Letting emotions take over. Buying a home can be an emotional process, but it's important to remain objective and avoid making decisions based solely on your emotions. It's important to consider the practical aspects of the home, such as its location, size, and condition. Great advice also. Um, I will say that emotions are an important part of this process. I've said that over and over again. Um, you can't let them take over, but at the same time, um, emotions, uh, you, you can't ignore your emotion. Buying a home is an emotional process. If you ignore that, you will lose sleep at night. You will regret your home purchase if you're purchasing a home. So that's something to really consider. Um, just for just for fun, I'm going to ask it, um, would you consider a real estate agent who has had a real estate podcast for over three three years to be an experienced agent. Let's see what it says. Hosting a real estate podcast for over three years can certainly be a valuable experience for a real estate agent as it indicates a deep knowledge and understanding of the real estate industry. However, it's important to note that having a podcast doesn't necessarily equate to being an experienced agent. Experience is typically gained through years of working with clients, negotiating deals, and navigating complex real estate transactions. When choosing a real estate agent, it's important to consider their experience and track record of success in the local market. Um, you may want to consider their credentials, such as whether they are a licensed real estate agent or broker, as well as their reputation, client testimonials. And then it says a few other things. By the way, if you guys um, ever want to look up uh, my client testimonials and, and those things, those are out on the major websites. However, um, I do it a little bit differently. I don't solicit reviews on Zillow and whatnot because it's just inefficient. If you get them on Zillow, you don't get them on the other websites. I use software called Testimonial Tree, which doesn't translate into a traditional Zillow review, but translates as a testimonial. You can find it. Um, and, and it's on the other websites as well. It's just you have to, to do it a little bit more digging. But if, if any of you are, are interested in looking for that, um, just let me know. I'd be happy to to direct you towards that. Um, I have, I don't know, I think, I think 70 or so testimonials on there. Um, all right, let's ask it. What are some common mistakes people make when selling a home? Let's see what it has to say. There are several common mistakes that people make when selling a home, including overpricing the home. Ooh, man. 
Uh, yeah, we've talked about this one before. If you overprice your home, I have a podcast I did a couple of years ago that showed that if you overprice your home, on average, you will sell your home for $12 a square foot less than the market. That's a lot of dollars for a 2,000 square foot home. That's $24,000. You don't want to overprice the home. Chat GPT thinks that setting the price too high can turn off potential buyers and lead to the home sitting on the market for longer than necessary. It's important to work with a real estate agent, of course, to determine a fair and competitive price based uh, uh, competitive price based on the local market. Yes. Um, neglecting to stage the home. Staging a home, this is number two for chat GPT. Staging a home can make it look more attractive to potential buyers and help them visualize themselves living there. Neglecting a staged home can make it look cluttered or uninviting. I will say um, it's still very much a seller's market. And if you have, uh, this came up recently in discussion, if you have a home that is uh, on the cheaper end of the spectrum, it's not a luxury home and it's completely empty, um, you don't need to feel like you need to leave furniture in there or bring furniture in there to help people visualize uh, what the home looks like. In most cases, um, it's just, it's the market, there's so little inventory, it's not necessary for you to do that additional step. There are some options for virtual, virtual staging that can be done. Um, that is kind of a, a midway point. Um, I've had uh, mixed responses to that from seller clients in the past, uh, but those are just some things to consider. Um, number three, failing to make necessary repairs. Buyers will often request repairs before closing, so it's important to address any known issues before putting the home on market. That's a great idea. Uh, because also, if you have known issues and you don't fix them, then you have to disclose them in the seller's disclosure. You don't want to have to do that if you don't have to. Um Number four, not working with an experienced agent. Yes, selling a home can be a complex process and working with an experienced agent can help you navigate the process. Listen, I so these two questions here where it keeps harping back to experienced agents, these are two of the questions I did not ask it ahead of time. So I did not know it was gonna say that. So I, I think that's very interesting. Um, I don't know if it's it's trying to give me re responses that I think it wants, but, uh, but it's interesting. Neglecting curb appeal. Uh, it says first impressions are important. Neglecting the exterior of the home can turn off potential buyers before they even step inside. Simple fixes like fresh paint or landscaping can go a, a long way in improving curb appeal. Yeah, I, I would take it a step further and consider um, consider what the when when you're selling a home, what is the buyer going to first interact with? Like for instance, are they going to go? Are you going to direct them through the front door or a side door? Um, and if so, how do those look? Is the lock difficult to handle uh to open to close is there are there issues there is it not well painted what what is that first impression does matter um and you need to think about it not from your standpoint you know you as if you're selling a home you've been uh you're used to certain quirks and there are some things that are really bothersome to you that you haven't gotten around to fixing right this is the, the case for every homeowner we all have things that we've created workarounds for that we are, are just used to having to, to deal with. And there are some things that just irritate us, but that we know are never going to get fixed um, anytime soon. Um, you need to set all of those things aside and think like a first-time home buyer. What are those things that are going to stand out to you? Uh, if you're the buyer of that house, you've never thought, you've never stepped foot on that house before. Um, number six, not being flexible with showings. Buyers can often have busy schedules and may need to view a home at a time that's inconvenient for the seller. Failing to be flexible with showings can make it difficult to sell the home. Yeah, absolutely. Probably the biggest uh, issue that I have with this is um, sometimes with clients that have uh, that have pets that can sometimes create some challenges for showings. And so my recommendation, if you have uh, if you have pets that you try to uh, find someone that can uh, that can pet sit for a time, at least during the first few days, you've got a home on the market. If you've got elderly people uh, living with you, family members, whatever the case may be, um, it's, it's a good idea to try to just get them out of the house the first few days of showing, try to figure out a way to do that. Um, because uh, oftentimes those first few days are the busiest. Um, so some good thoughts there. I, I like what I like what chat GPT is, is doing. Again, nothing groundbreaking, but these are 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 accurate things. It's it's saying things that um that are are helpful and and uh and accurate at the end of the day. All right, I'm going to ask it when people are searching let's let's get more specific. When people are searching for homes in Greenville, South Carolina, what types of searches are they making? It can it, this is one of the interesting things about this software is that it can uh scour 
aspects of the of the internet and, it, and it's aware of some aspects of the internet and it can it can provide results and actually tell us what people are searching for. And so here's a few common examples. It says location-based search. Many people may be searching for homes in specific neighborhoods or areas of Greenville, such as downtown Greenville, North Main, Augusta Road, or the east side. Interesting that it selects those four areas, Greenville, North Main, Augusta Road, or the east side, downtown Greenville, um, or, or, or those others. Um, those are some interesting options. Um, obviously, um, like North Main is like, essentially like a subdivision um downtown greenville is kind of a distinct area where if you're getting residential it's going to primarily be primarily be historic homes or condos um augusta road is is a, a kind of a catch-all term for uh you know one of the more expensive areas of greenville typically um that is kind of south of downtown and then east side is kind of a catch-all for kind of what i would consider to be like greenville's uh oldest suburban area as it were where there's a lot of uh a lot of subdivisions in that area that um that are you know 40 50 60 years old and and it's obviously a very nice area but much cheaper than those other areas mentioned by chat gpt so that's very interesting um number two on here price range shirt search buyers may be searching for homes within a specific price range that fits their budget such as homes under two hundred thousand. good luck uh, between 200 and 400,000 or over 500,000, not super helpful. Uh, property type search, some buyers may be searching for specific types of properties, single family homes, townhouses, condos, or apartments. Feature-based search, um, buyers may be searching for homes with specific features or amenities, such as number of bathrooms, uh, bedrooms, a, pool, a large yard, or a garage. Um, school district search, families with children may be searching for homes in specific school districts or areas with highly rated schools. New construction search, number six, um, number seven, investment property search. Um, investors may be searching for properties that offer rental income or potential for appreciation and value over time. Um, so th those are those are kind of generally generic. I like that first one the most because it kind of revealed a little bit about um, some of these areas that apparently are are pretty heavily targeted uh, by people when when they're doing uh, online searching for the Greenville real estate market. Um, let's ask it, can you give me a list of the top 10 things people are trying to avoid in Greenville based on historical searches? Let's see what it comes up with this. It gives a standard prompt that it doesn't have access to, uh, to historical data, but based on common concerns here in, in the Greenville area, here are 10 things that people may be trying to avoid. High crime areas, um, obviously, heavy traffic. Greenville's population has been growing rapidly in recent years, which has led to increased traffic and congestion. Some people may be trying to avoid traffic. Uh, flooding. While Greenville is not located in a high-risk flood zone, some areas may be more prone to flooding or uh, have a history of, uh, of flood damage. I just realized one second that my computer is not plugged in, so let me fix that real quick. All right, there we go. Environmental hazards, people may be trying to avoid areas with known environmental hazards, such as polluted water or air. Poor schools, families with children may be trying to avoid areas with low performing schools or lack of educational resources, expensive real estate, um, cost of living in Greenville has been rising, and some people may be trying to avoid areas with high real estate prices, limited job opportunities, um, extreme weather, uh, poor air quality, that's kind of a duplicate, um, noise pollution. Um, so those are kind of the, uh, the options that it is, uh, that it's saying there. Um, I'm going to ask it, are those search results generic or specific to Greenville? I want to see what it says. Cause they, they seem pretty, pretty generic. It says the search results that I provide are specific to Greenville, South Carolina. These are common concerns. Um, okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, perhaps the, the concerns of Greenville are just the concerns of everywhere. All right. Let's ask it, uh, which schools are being searched for the most? And I need to add in Greenville County. It gives it standard prompt that it does not have access to real-time data. By the way, ChatGPT, my understanding as of this recording, which is um, March of, of 2023, 
uh, that all of the data that's in here is current as of September 2021. So that's something to consider. So, uh, but that being said, some of the most searched schools for in Greenville County, South Carolina include number one, Riverside High School, Wade Hampton High School, Malden High School, JL Mann High School, Greenville High School, Eastside High School, Woodmont High School, Hillcrest High School, Blue Ridge High School, and Travelers Rest High School. Um, and it says it's important to note that search trends can change over time. These rankings may not be reflective of the current search trends. So that, that's a that's a very interesting uh, interesting list right there. Um, and that can perhaps if you're looking to move to Greenville, that can give you kind of a starting list to to uh, to search for some of the uh, schools around here. Um, let's ask it another question here. What are some what are the most this is a more generic question. What are the most popular updates to a home according to searches that people do online? Kitchen remodel, obviously. And when I when I tested this out before, the number one that it said was kitchen remodel. Number two, bathroom remodel. That was also number two when I did this search before. Uh, flooring update is number three. Painting is number four. Outdoor updates, such as adding a deck, patio, or outdoor kitchen is number five, energy efficient upgrades, such as new windows insulation or upgrading to an energy efficient HVAC is number six. Smart home upgrades is number seven. Additions, adding square footage to a home is number eight. Updating fixtures and hardware, such as light fixtures, faucets and cabinet hardware is number nine. Um, and basement remodel is uh, is number 10. Um, so nothing, uh, nothing groundbreaking there, um, but uh, for me, I find interest in the order that these things come in. And and I think it's there there is a level of accuracy to uh to the order at which and it from the standpoint of a of a ranking that uh that this came up with. I'm gonna ask it, can you break this down by percent just to see what it says? It does not want to do this. Um it says based on Common search trends and industry reports, the categories listed above are generally considered to be some of the most popular home improvement projects that homeowners search for online. All right. So it's not going to give us a breakdown by percent. I can't remember if I tested that one out before. Um, all right. So let's ask it another question regarding appraisals. I am having an appraisal done on my house. How can I be prepared for that? to make sure that the appraiser gives the home the highest value possible. This is a, a question that I get, um, and it's a great question, and I've had to um, multiple times address this um, and and handle this myself with appraisers. So um uh, says, for starters, clean and declutter. Um, a clean and tidy home will help the appraiser see the home's full potential. Um, remove any clutter to make sure your home is free of dirt and debris. Um, great idea. Um, I, I am fully on board with that. Um, particularly, you got to make sure that the appraiser can see everything, right? They, for whatever reason, if they need to get into the attic or the crawl space, which for certain appraisals they might need to, you need to make sure that those those are accessible. Um, any outbuildings they might need to get into, um, so you just you need to make sure they have uh, accessibility to those things. Uh, make repairs, yeah, absolutely. If if an appraiser now appraisers aren't going to spend a whole lot of time in your home. But if they see obvious things, they're going to deduct that um, from uh, from your home's value. Provide a list of upgrades and improvements. Yeah, great idea. Um, it, it says such as new roof, updated kitchen, renovated bathroom, provide receipts or invoices if available. You don't really need to provide uh, receipts or invoices, in my opinion. Um, I think yeah, it can be helpful, though, to put the amount of the update, like what it actually costs you. The appraiser is going to... Um, take that into consideration, but also take it kind of at face value as well. Um, but they do like that. They do like to know what uh, what updates you've done, and they do like to kind of have a sense of, of what those cost, particularly if they were more expensive. There's no point in putting like $100, uh, you know, faucet or something like that. They, they're not going to care about that. But if you did a kitchen remodel and it was a $75,000 remodel, that's very useful information for them. Provide a list of comparable sales. Um, I'm kind of, uh, uh, indifferent on that. Um, I typically don't find that appraisers, I, they don't, uh, dislike when you do that. 
on the front end. Uh, obviously, they're not going to expect the homeowner to do that. That would be more me, the agent, doing that. Um, but that's not going to change their process. They're they're going to do their own uh, comparable uh, analysis first, and then they might look at your comps after that. Typically, the way we handle this is if the appraisal doesn't come in where we expect it to, at that point, then we uh, submit a rebuttal and then ask for, and, and then basically submit a list of, of what we think are comparable sales that are more appropriate at that point. Um, number five, highlight unique features. Um, yeah, I, I think so. That The example it gives isn't, a, isn't good. Uh, swimming pool or a view. Um, a view, uh, I think, could be interesting. If you if there's like a certain part of the house that has a better view than others, or if there's like a part of the yard that has a unique view, I definitely think that that could be interesting, like a mountain view um, or like a lake view, something like that. Um, only if it's not obvious, though, if it is obvious, they're they're not going to need to know that um, be available for questions. All right. I, I think that this could be helpful, but I will say this appraisers. They don't want you to get in their way. They don't want you to follow them. Do not do that. You, you can totally be there and let them know, hey, if you have any questions, let me know. But just stay in your kitchen or whatever, diddling on your phone. And most likely, they won't have any questions for you. And do not take that personally. Um, and yeah, just be available. Don't do not do anything else. Um, and of course, number seven, it says be honest. Um, it, it says it's important to be honest with the appraiser about any issues with the home, such as a leaky roof or faulty HVAC system. Um, listen, uh, this is not a situation where you have to tell the appraiser everything is wrong with your house. If he asks, is the roof leaky? Um, then yeah, you you need to be honest about it. But you don't need to start off by saying, yeah, we have a, re a leaky roof. HVAC system doesn't work. Um, all of these types of things. You, you don't have to uh, do that to yourself. Don't, don't worry about that. All right. Um, let's see here. Moving right along. Let's see here. How long have we been going? Okay, we've been going for a little bit. So let me. I don't want to. I don't want to drag this on for too long. Um, let's ask it. I've got a gazillion questions here that I could ask, but I'm not going to ask every one that I have written down. Let's ask it. What are some staging rules of thumb? Let's see what it what it says. Keep it clean and clutter free. Neutralize the decor. Neutral colors and decor make it easier for the buyers to envision themselves in a home. Highlight the best features. Emphasize the best features of a home, such as fireplace, high ceilings, or a beautiful view. Add some greenery that can help liven up a room and make it feel more inviting. Let in natural light. Absolutely. Um, open up the curtains or blinds. Use proper furniture placement to help make a room feel more open and spacious. Avoid furniture in a way that uh, that blocks, kind of uh, uh, avoid placing furniture in a way that blocks traffic flow or makes the room feel cramped. Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually had had one of these recently where um, where we were thinking about staging or not um, and to stage would have demonstrated that uh, that uh, the dining room table was kind of blocking a major area. So we just chose not to and just let the let the buyer kind of envision for themselves what they might do with that space. Um, create a cohesive look. The decor and furniture in each room should have a cohesive look and feel. Make sure the decor and furniture complement each other and create a cohesive theme. Sure. Appeal to the senses by creating a warm and inviting atmosphere. Use soft lighting, pleasant scents, and soft music. Great. Um, keep it simple. Don't overdo it with decor or furniture. 100%. Um, that one of the main things that I have to do when I help people to, to get their house ready to list is to help them simplify. Because a lot of times people have, have accrued things over the years and they have a lot of personal pieces, a lot of personal furniture and decorations and whatnot that are important to them. We just have to kind of simplify it. Um, number 10, this might be one of the most important things out of all of them. Depersonalize the space. Uh, remove any personal items or photos that could distract buyers or make it harder for them to envision themselves in the home. 100%. You have no idea what the uh, potential buyer is going to think when they see all these personalized things throughout the house. Sometimes it's a positive, okay? I'm not going to pretend like it's always a negative, but sometimes it can very much uh, be a positive and, um, and, and, and very much be a negative. And it's just not worth the risk. Let the home sell itself. You don't need to be, there doesn't need to be personal things in the home that sells it. Um, let the home sell itself. 
depersonalize as much as possible. There's also some security risks. You know, if you got pictures of your children everywhere, just consider, you know, all of those different things. Um, all right. So I'm going to, so a, a few questions I'm not going to ask it that uh, could provide some interesting results. What concerns might someone have with purchasing a house with a pool? Um, if you're looking at a house with a pool, that could be, you know, interesting just to see what this software, uh, what the software thinks. Uh, if you're selling a house with a pool, same thing to get out in front of that. Um, I was potentially going to ask it, how can I alleviate those concerns? I'm not going to. Um, I am going to ask it this question because I think this is a good one for my newbie uh, or prospective uh, investors. What are some rules of thumb for people uh, to use when investing in real estate? says location is key. Um, that's obvious cash flow. Investors typically look for properties that generate positive cash flow. Value add potential. Yeah, you hear this a lot. Um, you, you especially want something where you're purchasing well below what the, the value add potential is, uh, which I'm not going to get into too much here. Diversify. Diversify your real estate investments. Um, that's not investing advice. That's Chad GPT. Do your due diligence have an exit strategy? I recommend multiple exit strategies. Use leverage wisely. Um, it's talking about financing. Yes, absolutely. Um, make sure that you don't over leverage yourself. Long-term mindset. Real estate investing is often a long-term strategy. Uh, work with professionals. It's important to work with professionals such as a real estate agent, attorney, or accountant to ensure you're making informed decisions. Yep, manage risk. It's important that you manage risk by diversifying. I want to ask, um, that that wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to say. So let me ask, do you know of any rules that people typically follow when investing in real estate to help guide them? Let's see what it says. Ah, yes. Okay, this is more what I thought it was going to say. The 1% rule. This rule states that the monthly rent for a property should be at least 1% of the purchase price. For example, if a property costs $200,000, the monthly rent should be at least $2,000. The 2% rule is the more conservative version of the 1% rule that the monthly rent should be 2% of the purchase price. It's pretty hard to, to hit that rule in the Greenville market currently. The 50% rule, this rule suggests that half of the rental income should go towards expenses such as mortgage payments, taxes, insurance, maintenance, and property management. The 70% rule, this rule suggests that investors should pay no more than 70% of the after repair value or ARV of the property minus the cost of repairs. This is commonly used in fix and flip investing. Absolutely. You hear people throw that rule around all the time. The buy and hold strategy involves buying a property and holding onto it long term. The Burr method stands for, this is number six, buy, rehab, rent, refinance, and repeat. It involves purchasing a property that needs work, rehabbing, renting it out, refinancing to pull out equity and using the equity to purchase another property. Very popular strategy. The cash on cash return. This metric measures the annual return on investment based on the amount of cash invested. It can be calculated by dividing the annual net operating income by the total cash invested. Um, what, what it doesn't say is that I, I typically hear most often people want to hit, you know, like a 20% cash on cash return. Um, so I'm a little bit surprised that it doesn't reference that, um, but that's kind of what I hear most commonly. And obviously the cap rate, this metric usually used more for commercial property, but it measures the rate of return on real estate investment based on the income generated by the property. It can be calculated by dividing the net operating income by the property value. There's a little bit more to it than that. Um, but uh, but again, this is why chat GPT, it's a guide. It's not going to, uh, it's not going to tell you everything that you need to know. Um, okay, gonna skip a few more, a few others that I was thinking about asking it, what are some requirements for me to get FHA or conventional financing? Um, I, I did this before and it really messed it up. It, it did not do a good job of replacing a realtor or a good loan officer in terms of answering that question. So I thought that was interesting. Um, I asked it, what are, or I was going to ask it, what are the most common phrases used in real estate listings? But instead what I'm going to ask it to do is to craft a real estate listing for property X that contains the 10 most searched for real estate words or phrases. 
And by the way, there's a lot of realtors using chat GPT to create listing descriptions for them. Now I have just for kicks have uh, attempted to use it a few times and it has not been very helpful for me. I, I cannot, it has not nowhere near uh, able to replace me crafting a listing description. Um, all right. So here's what a sample listing description using the Temo search for real estate words and phrases would be. Welcome to your dream home. This stunning property boasts a prime location in one of Greenville's most desirable neighborhoods with breathtaking views of the nearby mountains. The spacious home features a newly remodeled kitchen with granite countertops and stainless steel appliances, a cozy living room with a fireplace and a luxurious master suite with a spa-like bathroom. Enjoy the great outdoors in the beautifully landscaped backyard, complete with a large deck for entertaining and a custom-built fire pit. This home is move-in ready and has been meticulously maintained with upgrades including new flooring, fresh paint, and a new roof. Don't miss your chance to own this amazing property. Schedule your showing today. All right. Very, very good. Very good. Um, and last but not least, for, for those of you that are listening from out of town, I'm going to just ask it just for fun. What are some fun day trips from Greenville, South Carolina? Because one of the things that's great about Greenville isn't just what Greenville offers, but it's actually uh, the fun day trips that we have from uh, Greenville as a launching point. So it recommends Asheville located an hour and a half from Greenville, an hour, depending on, uh, you know, some parts of Greenville is only an hour away. Asheville is known for its vibrant art scene, craft breweries, and stunning mountain views. Take a hike on the Blue Ridge Parkway, explore the Biltmore Estate, or stroll through the downtown area for some shopping and dining. Yeah, absolutely. Asheville's great. Atlanta, uh, just a three-hour drive, really less than that, more like two and a half hours, offers a wide range of attractions, including the Georgia Aquarium, Great Aquarium, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. National Historic Site, also great. And the World of Coca-Cola, very underrated. The World of Coca-Cola is a very underrated uh, place to go. Highly recommend it. Columbia, South Carolina, just an hour and a half from Greenville, has a variety of attractions, including Riverbank Zoo, which is a, a, an excellent zoo, um, and, and uh, the South Carolina State Museum and Congaree National Park. I'm planning to hopefully go to Congaree a few times this year um, and do a little bit of kayaking. Charlotte? It's just a two-hour drive from Greenville and offers a variety of attractions, including the NASCAR Hall of Fame, the Mint Museum, and the U.S. National Whitewater Center. Chimney Rock State Park, an hour and a half from Greenville. Uh, it seems to be adding about a half hour to just about all of these, which is interesting. Um, Blue Ridge Scenic Railway, take a scenic tr uh, train ride through the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains. I have never done this. I, I don't know if, if that's worth doing or not, but that's an interesting suggestion. suggestion. Um, Great Smoky Mountains National Park. The Great Smoky Mountains National Park is located just two and a half hours from Greenville and features 800 miles of hiking trail, scenic drives, and stunning views. I love Smoky Mountains National Park. I believe it's the most visited national park in the U.S. Um, great spot if you like to hike, if you like the mountains. Um, there's plenty of stuff to do there, too, if, if particularly if you go towards Gatlinburg. Um, Greenville Zoo. Obviously, we have a small zoo here in Greenville, uh, but it's great. You can see the whole thing in one to two hours. Uh, Cleveland Park is right outside of it. Great little park, which connects to the Swamp Rabbit Trail. Um, so the accessibility of the Greenville Zoo. And I mean, you can ride a bike from the zoo into right into Falls Park of downtown Greenville in about 10 minutes. So uh, really great location there. Lake Lore, North Carolina, uh, an hour and a half from Greenville, again, closer to an hour, offers beautiful lake setting for swimming, boating and fishing, as well as hiking and mountain biking trails. Um, yeah, I love Lake Lore. White Waterfalls, I've never been here, is one of the highest waterfalls east of the Rockies and a popular spot for hiking and picnicking. I think I need to to look more into that, saying that's an hour and a half from Greenville. Um, I could could come up with a whole lot more, but th those are 10 good options um, for Greenville. If you are looking to uh, to potentially move here or are interested just in the area, there are a whole lot of uh, of day trips that you can do, even though there's plenty to do in Greenville, uh, plenty of day trips as well, plenty of things to do uh, just outside of uh, of Greenville as well, and that's that's one of the great things about this area that I that I really like. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed that. That's all we're gonna do because I, I don't want this to get too long. Uh, but there's a lot that you can use this Chat GPT software for. I'm sure that you guys could come up with even better ideas. So I'd love to hear if you guys could let me know what are some real estate searches that you think uh, could be useful for using this software for. I'd love to hear any feedback. 
Uh, my contact information is in the show notes. So that's where you can send that. Um, please reach out to me for any of your real estate needs. Please subscribe, rate, review, like all of those things to the show. I appreciate you guys listening. I appreciate you guys watching if you're on YouTube. Um, and we will talk again next time.